Calvin idolized his uncle, who filled a mentor role with his father being out of his life. Now that Calvin was an adult, he saw his uncle more as a peer, but he still revered him and sought him out regularly for guidance. So one day, when his uncle asked him to come to his place to do a favor, Calvin headed over without hesitation. What he found there shook him to the core. A dead body. His uncle assured him that all could be explained, but that he needed him to dispose of the body across town, to find a dumpster and leave it there. Calvin was torn between wanting to walk away and helping the man who had helped him so many times in his life. He made the fateful decision to do what his uncle asked. Over the next few days, he could think of nothing except the corpse he had abandoned in that dumpster. His uncle never checked in with him, and he did not return calls or texts. A week later, the police arrived at Calvin's door. He was arrested, charged, and convicted with accessory to murder. His uncle never vouched for him or admitted his culpability. Only Calvin went to prison, burdened with a lengthy sentence as well as the betrayal of someone so important to him. He was traumatized even before his cell door slammed shut. From our studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, this is the Psych Bites Podcast. The Psych Bites Podcast is where mental health professionals offer practical psychology to enhance your life. I'm Dr. Craig Pullman, neurodevelopmental psychologist. I'm Jennifer Feitz, licensed professional counselor. In this episode, we're talking about incarceration mental health implications, and issues related to re-entry into society. In the opening, you heard just part of the true story of Calvin. You'll hear the rest of Calvin's story at the end of this episode. But first, we'll go through a history of incarceration in the United States. And we're also going to have an in-depth discussion with a special guest who was incarcerated for 20 years and is grappling with the challenges of re-entry. All right, Fights. Why don't we get right to our timeline? Okay, let's do it today. So we're going to start in 1865 with the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Which stated, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So the catch was that middle phrase, except as a punishment for crime. That allowed for a modified form of slavery for decades after the Civil War through convicting black people of crimes. Laws, especially around vagrancy, were enacted to target black citizens. In North Carolina, for instance, people without jobs could be sent to court. If they could pay a fine, they were dismissed for a year. If not, they were deemed a vagrant and imprisoned. Now, fights, just time out here. Okay. We both studied U.S. history. We're required to as students. Correct. We both know that the 13th Amendment, you know, Lincoln freed the slaves. But did you know this backstory about what we're talking about here today? None. And and I think I, I had this dual reaction of feeling both very ignorant and then very angry and sort of shocked. I mean, I had no idea that this was in here. Right. I, I mean, I knew that Reconstruction was a very tough oh, yeah. period, and I knew about Jim Crow, but this, the, the, you know, what, what happened connected to the 13th Amendment was really shocking. So, yeah, yeah let's keep going here. With okay. vagrancy laws in place, a system called convict leasing emerged across the South. In 1883, 10% of Alabama's revenue came from the labor of convicts, By 1898, it reached 73%. Entrepreneurs began buying and selling convict labor leases for profit as the money-making potential increased, the incentive grew to arrest black people as well as poor people. There were little incentive to treat convicts well once they were leased out to work on a plantation or in a mine. The lessors had little interest in the convict's long-term health. Convict death rates were 10 times higher in states with lease programs. In 1873, 25% of black convicts died. Florida did not outlaw the leasing of prisoners until 1923, following the tragic story of Martin Tabbert, uh, uh, following that story becoming front page news. After hopping a train while traveling the country, he was arrested for vagrancy and sentenced to 60 days in county jail, 
where he shoveled swamp mud 15 hours a day. Mm. Malnourished, weak, barely able to work, he was beaten with a seven-pound strap until it killed him. Another trend of increased incarceration began in the early 1970s and quadrupled in ensuing decades. A study by the National Research Council concluded that the increase was historically unprecedented, that the U.S. far outpaced the incarceration rates elsewhere in the world, and that high incarceration rates disproportionately affected Hispanic and black communities. So let's go to 1994. And the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, known simply as the Crime Bill. This law, enacted during President Bill Clinton's first term, provided funding for tens of thousands of community police officers and drug courts and mandated life sentences for criminals convicted of a violent felony after two or more prior convictions, including drug crimes. The mandated life sentences became known as the Three Strikes Provision. The crime bill also included $8.7 billion for prison construction to states that passed truth in sentencing laws, requiring that people convicted of violent crimes serve at least 85 percent of their sentences. This created incentives for states to build prisons and increase sentences, contributing to increased incarceration. You know, there's this phrase, the prison industrial complex. You've heard that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. Uh, for his part, in a speech at a 2015 NAACP convention, Clinton acknowledged that tougher incarceration provisions in that bill were a mistake. He said, I signed a bill that made the problem worse. This was another thing that surprised me. Sort of like those early, yeah, that mean just mm. a study by the Brennan Center for Justice in 2015 found that incarceration has been declining in effectiveness as a crime control tactic since before 1980. Since 2000, the effect of increasing incarceration on the crime rate has been essentially zero. And you know, what's what works better is going to a big part of that is mental health. Right. Addressing mental health. I mean, and it's interesting is that I use analogies around some of this kind of frequently in my work when you look at like behaviorism and continued maladaptive behaviors or responses to emotions. But what I found is that this brings such a new light to a lot of that. I mean, I think it's going to be interesting to see how some of this education that I've had from just doing this podcast impacts the work that I do right. in my own office. Right. It's interesting. Today's American criminal justice system holds almost 2.3 million people in 1,719 state prisons, 109 federal prisons, 1,772 juvenile correctional facilities, 3,163 local jails, and 80 Indian County jails, as well as in military prisons, immigration detention facilities, civil commitment centers, state psychiatric hospitals, and prisons in the U.S. territories. Drug offenses account for the incarceration of almost half a million people. Police make over one million drug possession arrests every year, and many of these arrests lead to prison sentences. The U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world, despite the fact that the U.S. is not even close to the top of the list when it comes to countries with the highest rates of violent crime. Land of the free. Home of the brave. All right. On the other side, we're going to have our special guest with us, and and we're really looking forward to this discussion we're going to have with him. It's going to be good. As we mentioned up top, a special guest today is here, and we're really excited about having a discussion with him. Gemini Boyd is with us. All right. (laughs) Gemini is the founder and director of Project Bolt. Project Bolt's mission is to enhance the lives of criminally involved individuals by equipping them to become key contributors to society. Thanks for being here, Gemini. No, thanks for having me. We are excited you are here. <laughs> I'm got, excited you're here. We got a lot to talk about, a lot you're going to share with us and <clears throat> educate us. Um, I don't know about the educating part, but I'll try. <laughs> we all, we all have, it's about learning. We all have to no learn. better, do better. <laughs> so why, why don't you start off by telling us a bit of your story? <sighs> we got enough time? <laughs> you have exactly three minutes to tell your entire story. <laughs> no, um, 
I'm born and raised right here in Charlotte, North Carolina, from off the west side of Charlotte, off West Boulevard and Old Steel Creek area. And I always say, when I say Old Steel Creek, I always say the original Old Steel Creek because people that aren't from here, when you say Old Steel Creek, they think of 160 and the outlets and all that kind of, you know, the pretty little cute little area that it was, but that it is. But yes, I'm born and raised here. Uh, uh, man, I grew up in uh very poverty area where there was a lot of drugs being sold, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of violence, and I became a product of that. Hmm. I lost my father when I was about to turn 15, the, the, the only man that I ever knew to raise me, and when I lost him to violence, I think that's when my trauma started to kick in, even though I come from a, a, a family of alcoholism and mm. things of that nature to know what I know now and what I was going through as a child affected me on who I am now also. Like the trauma has just been embedded in me throughout the years. So it led me to do some things that when I was 16 years old, I was I shot somebody and I went to prison for it. I was charged as an adult. Uh, I received a six year prison sentence I did almost three years on that. And while I was incarcerated the first time in my life, uh, I was dealing with all those things that were going on in my head about, you know, reliving so much stuff. And I took a lot of classes, became well-equipped in small engineer, welding, all kind of stuff that I did while I was in there. I got my GED because I am... Highest grade that I actually completed in CMS was the eighth grade. But I did go, once I was incarcerated, completed my GED, first swing at it, knocked it right out the park. And because I was always told, that, man, you're just so smart and this and that. And I think back now when I was in school and to hear a white counselor try to tell me about who I was as a mm. black male was trauma in itself also. You're, you're talking about uh, uh, like a school counselor. Uh, like a school, school counselor? counselor, okay. Like from elementary school mm -hmm. on up, and they mm -hmm. trying to talk to you in a certain manner about telling you who you are, but really not understanding you. But I think it was all designed the way the system is, is set up. And back then, we're talking about in the 70s, where we were just now starting to really the integration of schools and things like that was just starting to happen. So once I came home from prison the first time, I came right back home trying to wanted to do better. I actually wanted to be a welder when I first came home. Couldn't find a job. No one would hire me because I had a felony conviction. So I went back to what I knew best, mm -hmm. and that was the streets. Went back into the streets, got caught up. Received a 30-year sentence for a nonviolent drug offense, a 20-year sentence for a conspiracy to a firearm, which was a total of 600 months. I eventually and, done— and, and by the way, that, that, was, that was related to the crime bill of 94, right? The, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. <clears throat> so you and, were swept up in that wave and of that incarceration. Whole, and that's another topic because we— People that make me mad sometimes when they always say Bill Clinton, quote unquote, was the first black president, I always get pissed off because I always say he wasn't. He was the worst president we had. People don't know that. But right now, today, prisons are still being opened that Bill Clinton signed off to have built. And he was the first person to speak out to say, no, nah, we're not going to change the crack law, the cocaine and the crack cocaine disparity. We're going to stay tough on crime and, you know what I'm saying, we're just going to continue to lock up black and brown people, basically is what he said. You know, he didn't say uh, the particular colors, but we all know who was affected by the crack era at that time. So in the course of my, I did 20 years in federal prison. Uh, lo and behold, uh, I was in USP Atlanta, was a federal penitentiary in Atlanta. Lo and behold, a very uh, uh, charismatic, um, smart, and intelligent black man became president. And in the course of his presidency, he changed laws about the disparity. 
seven years later, eight years later, rather, I walk out to federal prison and I and I come home and I start an organization and I'm working with the youth and I'm working with post incarcerated individuals and I enjoy it. I love it because I love helping people. I try to find a ways that every day that I wake up, I tell myself and I ask myself, what are you going to do today that you didn't do yesterday to make somebody else's life better than yours? That's Project Bolt. Exactly. Mm. So Project Bolt is my second child because <laughs> I have a 25-year-old daughter. Well, Project Bolt is my second child. And it was something that I thought of while I was incarcerated because I had to like change because over the course of my years, I came in at 22. So once I came in at 22 years old, I was, I was a baby. So I never forget riding on a plane with an individual. First time I've been shackled from my waist to my ankles, riding on an airplane. And it was an older guy. He was sitting beside me on the plane. He said, youngster, how much time you got? So I tell him, you know, the sentence that they gave me. He tells me I'm lucky. I said, man, did you just hear what I told you? I said, man, I got X, Y, Z amount of time. How am I lucky? I may not never go home. He said, nah, you got a date. I don't have a date. I know I'm going to die here. You got a date. So use it. Because one day you're going to go home. So use your time wisely. So over the course of years while I was in there, I never forgot that gentleman because he had, at the time, this was in 97, at the time he had been in like 14, about 15 years. You know, you go back, so like 82. He had been in there since 82 and he had a life sentence. And he's encouraging me, you know what I'm saying, about what could possibly happen for me. So Boat, Boat became something that I knew that had to happen for me and for individuals behind me. Because over the course of years, you become an old head. And I used to be looking at these dudes calling me an old head, but they were calling me an old head because of how long I had been incarcerated, not because I was at the time 35 or something like that. But at the time you've been in there 13, 10, 13, 15 years, people look at you like that because they look at you for guidance about how they can how they can navigate themselves through the system. And people would come up to me and say, Gemini man, you ain't never frowning and you know what I'm saying? You you always in good spirits. Like how you do it? Like, and I explained to them, you know what I'm saying, is that I'm not gonna let this win because I'm not gonna never acknowledge the fact that the time that they gave me is mine. Secondly, I'm gonna always keep my mind free from these prison walls. So I was never in prison. You know, I was always walking the streets of Charlotte. I was always out feeding the birds or driving my car or walking on the beach or, you know what I'm saying, living the life of my organization. In all actuality, I was walking around behind 60-foot walls of concrete and barbed wire fences. But as long as I kept my mind free, which was a struggle for me because some nights it would hit me and I would go to my cell and just cry and not understand why. Like, why are you hurting so bad? But I was hurting so bad because in all actuality, I could die in there. And what if I do die in there and they have to send my body home in a box to my daughter and my mama? Like, for you to live with that every day, man, for 20 years, that's, that's trauma within itself. So... Boat was created to prevent individuals from having to go through that. You know, Project Boat stands for building outstanding lives together. And the best part about it is the together. We have to do this together, collectively. We have to do this. So I came home with this idea, and that's who I am right now. And so that's what led me to be with you right now today. I mean, so, you know, I just enjoy it. And I love loving the life and the skin I'm in. You know, it, thinking, looking back to your time behind bars, you mentioned trauma. What did you know? And the statistics are really depressing in terms of mental health prevalence for prisoners. What, what did you see there in terms of mental health with other inmates? I mean, you literally see individuals, right? 
walking around, talking to themselves, walking. You know someone is dealing with trauma because they don't take baths and they're talking to themselves, and no one is trying to reach this individual. You have staff that's right there within the institution, and you got lives that are dying and walking around that one day they might walk outside these prison walls and no one is helping these individuals while they're in there. You got inmates, well, excuse me, I don't say inmates, but you got human beings that are walking around there that are suffering from trauma, that are trying to kill themselves, that are taking drugs to escape where they're, where they're at at the moment. And it's so, it's so heartening for people such as myself who I thought didn't have or wasn't suffering from anything, you know, because, okay, I am taking a bath or a shower every day. I'm not talking to myself every day. I'm not using drugs uh, while I'm incarcerated. I'm not trying to drink hooch while I'm incarcerated. So I'm thinking that I'm sane, but I'm only thinking that because of what I'm seeing around me every day, but not knowing that the human mind was not built for you to sit in a bathroom it's what I call those cells, were a bathroom. The human mind wasn't built for you not to know when there is light outside. The human mind wasn't built for you not to be able to see your reflection by looking at yourself in the mirror. Because when you incarcerate it, sometimes if you go to solitary confinement, they don't even have a mirror in there. They don't even have a window in there. So you don't even know who you are anymore. So you have to deal with all this compounded on the fact that they just gave me 600 months. Or my best friend that went to trial with me got a life sentence. Or my daughter is crying out to me, Daddy, when you coming home, can you come home now? And I can't. Like, so, you know, trauma from incarceration and uh, the justice system, no one is talking about it. And we're actually now in a position where people are being released. But released to what? So when they come home, we're looking at them like they're animals, but they've been caged like animals. No one has treated them as human beings, and then when they come home, they're still not treated as human beings. And we, we have to, I think, as a society, acknowledge that I mean, what you're describing, there, there's science to support mm-hmm. that the human brain is going to um, be changed from that mm-hmm. experience in, mm-hmm. in really mm-hmm. dramatic, traumatic ways. Mm-hmm. And... You know, uh, prisoners, human beings are going to leave prison at some point, and then we have to deal with that as a society. Mm-hmm. Um, I heard you talk about another time that we, we had a discussion, Gemini, about the what happens to the families mm. and um, people who are left behind, the, the non-incarcerated members of family. Could you talk a little bit about that? Cause that's, that's really powerful. To what I call it is uh, post-incarceration syndrome. And post-incarceration syndrome starts to affect children around at the age of five years old. These individuals see their mother, their brother, sister, cousin, or whoever uh, being harassed by police or going in and out of jail, out of prison. So they grow up thinking that their birthright is to either go to prison or end up in a grave. They don't grow up thinking that they want to be a psychologist. They want to be the next president. They want to be a doctor, anything. They don't grow up in that in, in that mindset. And so when they turn 13, 14, 15 years old, right, they they don't fear, they don't fear the law. They don't fear the police. Because for one, they don't love themselves. Secondly, no one has sat down with them to help them deal with the trauma that they're suffering from because their loved one is incarcerated. So the trauma, the induced trauma starts then. So how do we break it is the question. Well, we break it by trying to fix the justice system. You know what I'm saying? Because I always tell people that the justice system is working just how it's supposed to work. It's not broken. You know, people, oh, the justice system is so broken. We really need to fix it. No, it's not. The justice system is a machine that feeds off bodies who starts looking at these bodies at the age of third grade reading level. The minute that they figure out that they can't adequately read on a third grade reading Mm -hmm. level, 
that's the next recruitment for this machine called the system. So if we really want to do something, we fix the machine early on by not allowing it to chew up all these young African-American bodies, his Latino bodies. I wanted to jump in on something you just said a second because I think it's so important, but I want to make sure that I heard it correctly and then people that are listening heard it correctly. So I hear you drawing a connection between education. Exactly. And systemic <sighs> justice-related issues. And I don't know how to sum, that, sum up the other side of it, education. And, I mean, it's so interesting because my best friend works – diligently is an administrator in a it's a private school but it targets um poverty ridden areas looking at the idea that education is the key right education is the key to breaking this cycle um and so i hear about that all the time and so then to be speaking with an individual like yourself who is coming from the other direction and is also pointing a finger towards this this is where a lot of this system starts to break down I think is so huge for people to hear and pay attention to. Because I do, I think people point a finger at like the law or the justice system being the problem. We need to fix that. And there's a lot of really fancy people that are starting to have a voice to like, what's wrong with our prison system? What's wrong with our prison system? But I think you have the firsthand experience and then and and knowledge and key components of the fact that this starts much younger in a different quote unquote system. I always say this. I, I use this as a scenario, right? Say, for instance, you and I, mm -hmm. our lives were reversed. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You sitting in my seat, I'm sitting in your seat. Mm -hmm. If I grow up in a family of wealth, education, and just all things that make an individual succeed in life, Right? Because I believe right now, if they were to place drugs in the white communities right now, just dump it all in the white communities right now, right? And they started making money from it. Their lives become different and I, my, I become you, you become me. I know for a fact that education is plays a part because if I was going to private schools or if I had a family that come from college graduates historically, eventually I graduate from college. I know from what I know now and understand about who I am. I got I just told you I completed the eighth grade, literally. Do you know what you were doing in eighth grade? Your family was already setting your plan up for you for college. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the case in my family. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. From the eighth grade, two years later, I was incarcerated. I was in prison. <sighs> two years later, I had a, two years from completing the eighth grade, I was already in prison. Four years after that, five years after that, or whatever it is, from the 10th grade to maybe till I was 20, 21, I was already setting myself up for almost a lifetime in prison. But if the roles were reversed or different, I would know... I always look at myself and I'm going to be successful one day because I believe in me, mm. first of all. I don't use it as, okay, I went to prison. I understand the obstacles that I face every day. I, I face 45,000 different obstacles having a felony conviction over my head. Those are the barriers that I face every day that the average person walking around on the street doesn't face. Like every day, you know, you can wake up, you're going to do this, you know, but every day I have to fight from the trauma that's dealt, that I deal with every day, whether I'm going to have a job, whether I'm going to be on the streets or not. I have to fight the demon of not going back to the streets. That's a demon within itself. Joe and I were really grateful that you're here with us today. We got a lot more to talk about, <laughs> in, including more about Project Bolt and what's hap what we can do better post-incarceration. And we'll talk more on the other side. All right, sure thing. Estimates are as high as 37 to 44 percent of prevalence of, uh, of inmates and prisoners having mental health problems. There is some indication that the criminalization of mental illness is more prevalent in urban settings than in rural settings. 
Brian Stevenson, the author of Just Mercy, estimates that over 50% of human beings in prisons behind bars have some sort of mental health problem, and 20% have some sort of serious mental problem, mental health problem, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depression. A 2017 report by the Bureau of Justice Statistics estimated that 54% of prisoners and 35% of jail inmates who had some sort of major mental illness before going behind bars received any treatment mm. once they were behind bars. So we're talking. So again, that's 54%, about half, and 35% in jails. That's those are not high numbers of people who have diagnosed major mental health problems who are not being treated once they're behind bars. Gemini, you, I mean, t- get- <laughs> I can I can see your wheels spinning over there. Yeah. I can see your wheels starting to spin. I'm trying to like uh, grasp you, around those numbers, right? Do they sound right to you no, from your experience? Because I believe that the numbers are higher than that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because you're taking what you have heard about, or what that, that you're taking something that from the intake screening when you first go in, they ask you particular questions. So everybody that's going in there for screening is not going to tell you that they're suffering from some type of mental illness. Well, I, do you think you knew? I mean, you spoke pretty clearly to this word trauma, and I'm, I'm drawn to that word because of, of my background, of the work that I do. But do you think you knew? So, like, if somebody's asking you a question and saying, do, are you anxious? Do you have anxiety? I mean, when I see that walks through my office, right, a lot of times, because of what we know the brain will do, we will live a certain way for long enough and things become normalized. Like I'll say, are you anxious? I'll be like, I'm not anxious. And then I'll give them some sort of screaming and, and they'll come off, off the charts anxious because our brain becomes used to something. So as I hear you describe growing up you know, a, around violence or within a, within a culture that that was prevalent and in a daily interaction, did you then know that you had experienced trauma? Would you have said... I have PTSD or I'm traumatized. No, I, w- I want to say that like you would have had to give me more years. Right. So, so even so, answering that question when you come in. It, it, that's you, my yeah. that's my point. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So do you do the rescreening again about this? It goes back to what you said. You become prevalent of mm-hmm. believing that mm-hmm. you never had you never mm-hmm. suffer from trauma mm-hmm. until we start doing surveys or taking tests or. Or, or giving someone something to, to, to go off of, we would never know the real number. But I'm here to tell you that that number is totally incorrect because j- just from experience, just from experience, like if people like me who have suffered from trauma never existed, you wouldn't have a job. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. we actually get this information from what I quote unquote, the one word that I hate that we use nowadays and that's data that's all the world goes off of is data graph charts so we have we are now programming the brain to think that data means human Mm. right so we're forgetting about the human being and we're just looking at the stats statistic numbers data graphs charts not saying to ourselves that this is a human being i'm talking about And it becomes easier for you to do your work when you're just looking at data. Even you can forget that the human being exists Mm -hmm. because you're just looking at data. So technically, you could be suffering from something. Oh, we already knew that. You feel what I'm saying? (laughs) When When we really look at everything that sits around us every day. It, it seems to me that the, the people who are behind bars, so you've got a lot of people have mental illness before they end up behind bars. And that could be part of the reason that they mm-hmm. uh, make the choices that they do. Exactly. Yeah. But then there's the trauma and the mental health illness that develops behind bars. So people who may go in with a relatively healthy brain or maybe it exacerbates. Is that – am I thinking of it the right way? I mean, do, uh, I mean do you see that Because I, w- I would say probably like – like 60, 60 to 65 percent of the people before they committed the crime probably were suffering for something. Right. So you compound that by 65 percent of the people that are walking in the door having a mental mental health issue. Right. You compound that by the individuals that are already in there. Mm. Right. Who have over the years. Right. Developed some type of trauma mm-hmm. while living in there. That's why it's no such thing as prisons. You right. take 65% of the people walking in the door into a nut house, excuse my French, because I know they don't like to use that, but until that's what I call prisons, though. 
I'm not really talking about the actual medical uh, health places that you go, but I'm talking about the prisons. You take 65% of the people and just dump them off into there where they're already people are already walking around just out of their mind. Mm-hmm. So, so clearly, as a society, as a country, we need to do better with diagnosing and treating mental illness in our prison populations. Oh, and, 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 and it, it, it's, I mean, it's about, I mean, to me, it's about humanity, but it's also about mm-hmm. prevention because right. these human beings, yes. a lot of them are going to come back out in society. And, and if well, we so I mean, like, I, you know, to use, to use your, to use your story and to use your point. So you got, you know, you go in the first time as a juvenile. At mm-hmm. 16. And so in my head over here is already knowing what I know about adolescent brain development, right? Okay, so then... 25. Okay, so then you... <laughs> so then you get out and you talk about how the fact that you were motivated. You had received training in prison, right? So you had gotten your GED, you received training in prison, and you come out and you're motivated. You want to, you know, quote unquote, do right, right? I'm going to get a job. I've got something that I'm interested in. And here I go, right? So then you start talking about the inability for you to find a job. An inability for you to to make good on this education that you were given. And I'm going to jump in and say, and so this is where I want you to correct me, that depression may have set in, right? Discouragement, disappointment that could then be, you know, if we need to generalize into something like like depression, which then led you to say, well, this is what I this is what I know, that this is the education that I first knew. And so then I'm sort of going, okay, so you've got secondary trauma, secondary mental health that was there as a product of the fact that you didn't necessarily get what you needed or our society didn't do what needed to do to help you out the first time you got out. I like the three Ds that you use, the discretionary, the depression, and the, uh, what was the other one? Discouragement, disappointment, and depression? Exactly. I like the three Ds. You should (laughs) do something with that (laughs) because uh, technically that that could have been the point, I mean, the issue because... Mm -hmm. I was depressed because at that time you realize that ain't nothing out here for me but what I know best because here I am trying to do the right thing. I become discouraged. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Mm -hmm. Only reason why I would use the word depression would be because of the discouragement part. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's what I would be depressed about, not Mm -hmm. depressed about any other issue, you know, Mm -hmm. but it helps like it way creates the, The uh, I don't know how I can use it, but it created something within me to help keep me induced in this trauma, Mm -hmm. which developed Mm -hmm. even greater down the line. Because every day I wake every day that I either lay down at night right now today, every day that I lay down at night, one of the last things I think about is when I was in prison. One of the first things I think about when I wake up is when I was in prison. Mm -hmm. So we're not even tackling these issues right now to help these in over 80 percent of the people that are incarcerated come home. So let's go there. All right. (laughs) So um, post incarceration reentry, what do we need to do better? And and you can talk about Project Bold. What what, what is your 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 firsthand experience and expertise? What can we do better as a society with that whole process? Well, the first thing that we need to do is recognize that society, once an individual has been incarcerated he don't owe he or she doesn't owe society nothing let's get that barrier all the way out the way i'm coming out here with a clean slate treat me like i have a clean slate you've served your time exactly Mm -hmm. right so then we start looking at each other like we're human beings Mm -hmm. first of all because like i say we go back to the data and all that but we need to start recognizing that you are human i am human Mm -hmm. you can put your hand on me and i am human Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. i'm not something that you've read about or you look at on the chart secondly we need to help make sure that we are providing uh therapy for these individuals when Mm -hmm. they come home Mm -hmm. because i firmly believe that anybody that's been incarcerated for a certain amount of time they need to receive a check every month technically speaking they need to receive a check every month because that check and that monies will help them to endure what they've been going through all these years, right? We know they're dealing with trauma. So why not, why why they can't file something through the government to receive a check to help with housing, create jobs for these individuals when they're coming home? And and by the way, you know, investments like that are a lot cheaper than building more prisons. Thank you. And, Mm -hmm. you know, investing in that. But that's just a perception that we must always Mm -hmm. continue to believe that, 
that way doesn't exist. But the more prisons will be more prevalent for us to have an understanding because psychologically, even all the ones who think that they aren't suffer from something, Mm -hmm. believe now also that prisons is the way. Throw them in there. Throw away the key. But I I, I challenge you to go right now when you leave from either looking at this or hearing this, go shut yourself in your bathroom for 24 hours. And when you come out of there, you tell me the same thing. Like I challenge anyone to do that, to go in there and lock the door where you can't get out. And you tell me if this person shouldn't receive some type of some type of help, some type of assistance from dealing with that for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And, and if we don't do that, that's where the cycle comes in mm-hmm. because it's just it, – you get recidivism. You get yep. – um, and, and you talk about the family systems and, the you know, children are growing up in that environment. They're predisposed – to violence and making poor decisions. So we have to have to stop that. You know what is in my head, though, that I think is so interesting is that quote from Utopia, Thomas More. So he wrote that in the 1500s, right? I mean, so this is not, and the quote is, for if you suffer your people to be ill-educated and their manners to be corrupted from their infancy and then punish them for those crimes to which their first education disposed them, mm-hmm. what else is to be concluded ah, to be concluded from this but that you first make thieves and then punish them? I like that. I need that. So, I mean, this this is not new. new. <laughs> this is not new. But the problem is, is that what we have seen is the solution to the problem is what you just said. We'll just throw away the key. You know, lock them up and throw away the key. We'll just make more prisons. We'll just take all the people that can't seem to make the right choice and we'll throw them behind bars. Without. Right? Without any help. And and what you're talking about is this the greater systemic issue of recognizing the the trauma and the generational exactly. exposure to some of this and that that's what we're talking about. But I think what's so discouraging, I mean, you know, Thomas More wrote this book in the 1500s. This is not new. But yet and still <laughs> we're not. We're still. We're still doing the same thing, which I laugh over here. It's like, what's the definition of insanity? Right. Exactly. Doing the same thing over and over so again and expecting different results. That's where I come back with. You feel me? That we all are suffering from something because we're looking for different results. We know the study, right? We have all the language, the science, all the yeah. text, mm-hmm. everything, but mm-hmm. yet and still we won't do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Is it because we've got caught up in doing what's wrong? So we accept it. We accept the fact that I, I was just telling someone that 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 filmed something on Facebook Live where a young man was laying in the street. He is blown out. The young man that just got killed yesterday. Got day four yesterday. Here, got here shot Charlotte. in the head. You got mm-hmm. shot in the head, right? People have become immune to seeing that. Amen. So they can just sit there and watch it and film it. Mm-hmm. Amen. Same thing goes on with incarceration and individuals who are suffering from trauma. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. We watch them come out. But yet and still, we don't help them. So when they go back or when they do something, that's when we say, oh, this individual had a mental health. You're damn right he did. But you never recognized it while he was incarcerated or why he was coming up. Or if you look at the history of his family, if you go back historically in his family, somebody probably was a schizophrenic. Somebody probably suffering from PSD. Mm-hmm. Posting, uh, P- po- PTSD. 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 Mm-hmm. Somebody was probably suffering from that. Somebody probably was an alcoholic or drug mm-hmm. user. Mm-hmm. that was trying to escape from something that happened in their life that they could have witnessed. Mm-hmm. The fetus now, they scientifically, they're saying that you can, from, this, from, this, from the sperm of the male, mm-hmm. you can induce psychological trauma. Mm-hmm. The woman carries it in the fetus. And so when the baby is born, now they're going all the way back to, to why the woman is carrying the child for nine months. Mm-hmm. The thinking being the hormones and the biochemistry yeah. is, is so, changing the development. I think to your point is that we need to recognize that we're each human beings. That's and all. That, and that we're not a number. We're not a statistic. That's all. Yeah. Hey, Gemini, we're coming to the finish line here. What can the listeners do to support Project Bolt? Well, first of all, you can look Project Bolt up on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Uh, Project Bolt 2018. Uh, and also, you can look me up on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or as uh, Nai Ladare, L A D A I R E. Or if not, man, I always just give my direct line. Uh, you can hit me up via email, J Boyd, J B O Y D, 0818 at gmail.com. 
or you know you can give me a call because I'm 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 an open book and it's 980-395-8643 and I look for people to really want to get on board and trying to help this this type of uh, of organization that I'm trying to create grow because the United Ways, the Red Crosses and all the other stuff aren't doing anything. Start the people that are closer to the problem are closer to the solutions. So let's create that. We, we will make all that contact social media information prevalent on our social media, on Psych Bites, and we'll put it up as well. All right. Thanks a lot, Gemini. No, thank you for having me. The trauma of the betrayal Calvin suffered was amplified by what he saw and experienced behind bars. Weeks turned to months, turned to years, and Calvin's mental health deteriorated even as he accessed on-site counseling services. Sensing weakness, some inmates taunted Calvin, even suggested that he take his own life. They told him to be sure to go uptown rather than cross town to do the job right, meaning make a long gash from his wrist up to his forearm rather than across his wrist so that he will bleed out faster. One day, Calvin took that advice, going uptown when he was alone in the shower room. A guard on rounds happened upon him just moments before he slipped away. His physical wounds were healed during a stay in the infirmary, but he was even more traumatized upon his return to the general population. All he could do was go back for more counseling. Which, by the way, was provided by fellow inmates under the supervision of a psychologist who never met face-to-face with Calvin even once. Those inmates were paid $5 a month for providing so-called therapy. Brandon Gage is our producer. Sean Beck is our sound engineer, theme music composer, and video editor. Executive producers are Dave Verhagen and Frank Gaskell. Our special guest this episode was Gemini Boyd, founder of Project Bolt. Jen Neitzel of the Educational Equity Institute also contributed. You'll find more practical psychology to enhance your life on our website, psychbytes.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at psychbytes. You can reach us via email, podcast at psychbytes.com. Please send us questions, thoughts, and suggestions for show topics. We are available just about anywhere you find your podcasts, including Spotify, YouTube, and iTunes. Please spread the word and subscribe. Your positive ratings and reviews really help us to build our audience. Until next time, I'm Craig Pullman. I'm Fights, and this is the Psych Fights Podcast. <laughs>